This continues a series of lectures on Christian doctrine by Dr. Joe Sprinkle. Today's lecture is on calling, conversion, regeneration, and adoption. What does it mean to be born again? How does the gospel message become effective? What is the new relationship with God and with each other that follows conversion? Well, that's the kind of things that this lecture on calling conversion, regeneration, and adoption will address. So let's start with the first one, calling. Calling is God's summoning of individuals and people to himself. And there are two types of calling. Calling of conversion, that is calling non-Christians to become Christians through the gospel. Indeed, the word church, ecclesia, means called out ones, etymologically. And so the church are people that have been called from uh, uh, being non-Christians to being Christians through the gospel. So that's one kind of calling. The other kind of calling is vocation, the calling of a believer to a specific place, task, or occupation in life. Some verses about calling to salvation, Acts 17.30. In the past, God overlooked such, such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Isaiah 40, uh, 45 and verse 22, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. That's a calling to salvation. Uh, Mark nine thirteen, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And uh, some uh, versions of this, sinners to repentance. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus uh, calls people by saying, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humbly of, humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Acts 2.39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all those whom the Lord our God will call. Again, that seems to be the call of salvation. And then Romans 8 to 28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, that is called to become Christians. Now, in reality, only some will respond to the gospel call. And even the ones that respond are very undeserving. You have a parable in Matthew 22 uh, where the kingdom of heaven is compared to a king uh, who prepared a banquet for his son. He sent servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. And uh, he sent his servants, but they paid no attention and went off. The rest seized the servants, mistreated, and killed them. And so the king was enraged, verse 7, and he sent an army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And so the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. And then the summary of the story, for many are invited, literally called, but few are chosen. Now, the ones that were most deserving, most of them did not respond to the call to come to the king, which would represent God. Uh, but uh, uh, the ones that did respond were the people on the street corners who uh, were both bad and good. And uh, thus it is with the gospel. Uh, not all will respond, and the ones that do respond are not necessarily the most deserving of humanity. Cottrell summarizes the language of uh, calling this way. By whom are we called? By God himself. And you have uh, passages in Romans and Corinthians and First and Second Thessalonians and 
First uh, and Second Peter that talk about being called by God. Called from where? Well, from the old creation, from the world as it exists under the curse of sin and darkness. Uh, Colossians 1.13, 1 Peter 2.9, from the mass of unbelieving Jews and Gentiles alike, Romans 9.24. But then called by what? Called through the gospel of grace, which is the power of God unto salvation. I have some verses that go along with that. Uh, you were called in the grace of of Christ, some translations by the gospel of his grace. Second uh, Thessalonians 2.14, he called you through our gospel uh, that, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to also to the Greek. It is through grace and is the power of God uh, unto salvation. A bit more on the concept of calling. Again, the Eglisia, the church, is the collective group of people who have answered the gospel call. Calvinism and Arminians see the uh, calling in different ways. Calvinism sees the call to salvation as an effectual call in accordance with their concept of election as irresistible grace and the absolute unconditional sovereignty of God. They would say that whoever God calls will always respond to that calling and become Christians. It is a effectual call in that sense. And if a person has not responded, then that means that God did not effectually call him. Arminians, however, see the call of salvation simply as the gospel call in general to sinners to repent. And the effectiveness of it is contingent upon their free will response. If they choose to respond, they will be saved. If they choose to reject the gospel, they will be lost. Jack Cottrell uh, describes it this way. He says that the gospel invites us, quote, to come out from the world in general and to live holy, pure, and separated lives. Uh, passages in Thessalonians, Timothy, Peter, Ephesians. As Paul puts it, we are called to be saints. Romans 1.7, 1 Corinthians 1.2. We are the camp of the saints, Revelation 20 and verse 9. Here is the second Greek word that characterizes the nature of the church as a holy separated nation, a hagioi, which is translated saints. This word basically means holy ones, that is, ones who have been separated or set apart into a, a special relationship with God. It is used in the New Testament to describe the body of believers as a whole, not just a select few of spiritually elite. Uh, it refers to the church as a holy nation, the ecclesia that has been called and set apart uh, from everyone else. Now, in addition to the call of salvation, God also calls people to tasks and vocations. So in Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, uh, Paul said, uh, 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 the Holy Spirit said uh, uh, through the church, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them. And that work, as it turns out, is to be missionaries to the Gentiles. Well, uh, they were already uh, saved. They were already called to salvation before that. Uh, but now they are called to a particular service. Uh, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul speaks of himself as called to be an apostle. There he's called to a particular church office. So that's calling. Let me move on to the concept of conversion. Conversion is our willing response to the gospel call in which we repent of sins and place our trust in Christ for salvation. And there are lots of verses that uh, call people to convert, even whether or not it uses that language. 
Uh, Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Uh, Acts 11, verse 21, a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Uh, Acts 26, verse 20, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Now, there have been times in history where greater or fewer numbers of people have converted. One time of conversion was during the time of uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield uh, from about 1725 to 1775. Uh, this period is called the First Great Awakening in uh, United States history. It's a period of large-scale conversions. Uh, led by uh, those two preachers, among others. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, by the way, is most famous for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which would give you an idea of the kind of things he said in his preaching. But then you also have the Second Great Awakening that uh, went from about 1800 to 1861. It began at Yale College under its president, uh, Timothy Dwight, uh, and it spread west under Presbyterian preacher James McCready and his uh, convert, uh, Barton Stone, who became part of what is called the Restoration or Stone-Campbell movement. It was... Uh, uh, a key event at the beginning of it was the Cane Ridge Revival. Stone participated in a great revival at the Cane Ridge, uh, Kentucky uh, area, where in August of 1801, a much larger uh, uh, interdenominational camp meeting was held for six days and nights uh, with between 10 and 25,000 people in attendance. And many of them uh, came forward and gave their lives uh, to Christ in an act of conversion. This second great awakening was when uh, one uh, particular movement in the church, the Restoration Movement, uh, uh, had its uh, beginning. Uh, the Restoration Movement was a child of uh, the frontier preaching of the second great awakening. And others involved in this uh, movement were Presbyterian preacher Charles Finney, Again, active uh, through most of the 19th century. Uh, he was one of the famous evangelists of that era, era who refined the art of highly emotional appeals to conversion. In the late 19th and 20th century, uh, that was the era of mass evangelists. You have people like Dwight Moody, uh, who uh, was the founder of the Moody Bible Institute, uh, who was active in the late 19th century. You have uh, Billy Sunday, uh, who was active into the 20th century. Uh, Billy Sunday was a uh, baseball player that uh, became an evangelist and uh, was very effective in his uh, uh, high-pressure preaching. And then you have, uh, in the 20th century, the most famous mass evangelist was Billy Graham, who would have crusades in which he'd fill whole uh, stadiums of people and preach the gospel, and many would respond to his message. So that's conversion. I move on to regeneration. Regeneration is an instantaneous one-time event that happens in the moment of conversion when the sinner passes from his lost state into the saved state. So what is regeneration? It's a work of God the Holy Spirit upon the sinful soul, an inward change in the sinner's very nature. And the scripture refers to this as the new birth or being born again. And there are many verses about this. John 3 and verse 3, various verses in John 3, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit.
1 uh, Peter 1.23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And then 1 John 5.1, 